Hi everyone, welcome back to Nonviolence International's YouTube channel. I'm so excited to be joined today by Ms. Asmira Hamori Davis. Um, she is a leader in the arts and nonviolent resistance. She's known for her curriculum, Cap Poetics, which uses the creative process in order to break the boxes, um, which is another series that she has. Um, which allows us to break the obstacles in our life. So I'm so excited to hear from you. And I love your po poetry. I'm so excited to maybe see if you will share some with us. Um, but before we begin, will you explain a little bit um, to everyone about your background, how you became interested in the arts and interested in this poetry, um, and just like how that relates to your work today? Yes, oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. Um... Catherine, I'm really, really honored and, and blessed to share time with you. Um, so I am originally from Ke'au, Hawaii, a super small town on the big island of Hawaii. And I was born to two parents who are first and foremost artists. Um, so I grew up um, listening to my dad constantly play his Nyabingi drum, singing songs, um, and my mom um, also singing and creating her music. Um, so my parents encourage a lot of creative expression and freedom of expression at an early age. And I was introduced to Capoeira, the Afro-Brazilian martial art, when I was seven years old. Well, really, when I was four, I saw my first sort of class, but I, I really began to train when I was seven. Um, and, um, and I loved it and I stuck with it until I was 12. And I found that whenever I trained, it was a source of not just self-discipline, um, it instilled in me some self-confidence and esteem. Um, it connected me to community and it made me feel free. I felt present. I felt centered. It was a gift to be embodied in that practice. Um, and so of course, naturally, as I got older, I continued to connect with it in different ways. Um, and in college, while I was at the University of Southern California, I, I ended up majoring in visual and performing arts um, and social sciences psychology. And while I was doing that, I re-entered into the Capoeira community where I began to learn more about the cultural significance, the history, um, the network, the global network that Capoeira is a part of, but also its its origins. I got more curious about its Afro-Indigenous origins. Um, and that led me to create um, a poem called Capoeira, which um, was the very first poem of the Break the Boxes spoken word series. And initially I created that poem to just share what it meant to me to have the possibility to study abroad in Brazil something that for me as a first generation college student, I never would have guessed in my wildest dreams would be possible. Um, but education has a way of opening up portals of possibility. And so Capoeira was the birth of the Break the Boxes spoken word series. It, you know, I, I raised maybe $1,200 to help pay for me to study abroad for a month. And while there, um, I, remember walking inside of this historic preservation site called Pelourinho Square. And Pelourinho Square, for those who don't know, um, Salvador Bahia, Brazil, is where Capoeira originated. And Pelourinho Square is where the enslaved were brought for the slave auctions. Um, and Salvador Bahia, Brazil, houses the largest population of Afro descendants outside of Africa. And that's significant because Capoeira's history, it's, it's rooted in a history of resistance, of revolution, but also of creativity and innovation. So the enslaved weren't allowed to practice self-defense, so they disguised it as a dance. So a lot of the movements almost look like a dance. Um, the craft itself was outlawed um, for a long time after the emancipation of um, uh, the enslaved in 1888, Brazil was the last country in the Americas to abolish slavery. Um, and though it was abolished, um, Afro people would be um, incarcerated if they were found on the streets practicing capoeira. Um, so it wasn't until later 1937 that capoeira itself began. Um, it was deemed an actual craft and part of um, like cultural fabric um, indeed, it was deemed a sport in Brazil. And that's significant to me because when I went to Brazil the first time, as I was walking inside Pelourinho Square, I noticed, I realized that I had this memory of growing up and training in our academy, and there was this mural on the wall, and it was colorful, and it had a lot of different colorful buildings. And on the floor, there was like this, it was like 
a charcoal black like ground with a couple of different people like bent over kind of beginning to play. And I never knew that that place existed growing up until I realized I was walking inside the mural when I was walking in Pelodino Square. And that kind of told me that I needed to spend more time. I needed to come back. So um, after that month, I decided to work on a Fulbright Creative and Performing Arts Research Grant. And I, <laughs> so my mom might say overworked, but I really put everything I had into it. And anyway, I continued the Break the Boxes series. Um, and so after creating Capoeira, we created a poem, um, we brought to life a poem called The Future, which really is just an affirmation of all things positive that are to come in the face of adversity. Um, and in the face of also struggles, interpersonal struggles, mental health struggles, um, just so many obstacles that we as humans experience, whether they be, you know, the intersections of race, class, gender, or just the, the struggle of believing in yourself sometimes. Um, and so after the future, we created this poem called Freedom. And Freedom was created um, feel free to stop me whenever you need if I am a little long-winded. No, no, no. I'm, I'm so interested and I'd love to hear about all of these things and how you got involved in your fellowship in Brazil and everything. So please keep going. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Freedom, which was one of my favorites that was made with Hunter Bermudez, who is a brilliant editor and filmmaker, um, also a USC Trojan. Um, uh, it was made in response to the acquittal of Darren Wilson after murdering um, Mike Brown. And I remember feeling so helpless, like so many of my peers on campus. And I remember for the Martin Luther King Jr. like celebration um, every year in February, I was asked to share a poem. And so that's where I shared the poem Freedom. And I asked myself, what does freedom look like to you? What are you fighting for? What does it look like? And I began to characterize what it looks like, what it smells like, what it tastes like, how does it feel? And I found so much power in being able to like visualize it in that way. And with my background in theater, there's so much of what we, the exercises we were doing in our theater classes with Anita Deschelle Sparks, who is a brilliant um, mentor and um, actress and director and um, visionary, we would do those exercises. What, it, what, what are you thinking, feeling, tasting, touching, smelling, those sensory exercises. And after writing and sharing that poem, I asked some peers what freedom looks like to them. And that's when we engaged on this really fun process of um, marrying movement and dance, my dear, friend, Vusala George was a dancer. And so she shared some of her dance in the video. She danced to this song called Holocene by Bonnie Vare. And a few other that. friends. Yeah, it's, oh, oh Bonnie Vare is just beautiful. <laughs> really, I have all this dancing and this poetry and freedom and this song that sounds amazing. Oh, I, that that's one poem that I, to this day, share a lot for myself to remember. <laughs> like this is, the joy in the creation. Um, and so after that poem, um, some loved ones and friends were like, hey, I wanna be involved. And I, I said yes to learning what it would look like to incorporate um, an organization as a young <laughs> junior, um, soon to be senior, and thankfully was able to utilize some of the resources at USC to kind of get the kind of forms together and begin to learn what that process is like. So Break the Boxes is, is it's a public charity that centers um, introspective, like we promote and produce introspective art. Um, and Capoetics is, is the actual practice. So it's the workshops. Um, it's the way of knowing and way of being. It's the saying yes to being able to be fluid, to be grounded in our needs, but fluid in our desires, whatever that may be. If I desire to imagine myself more free than I am in this moment, if I desire to see um, my loved ones happy, healthy, whole, if I desire whatever, it's this principle, it's, it's rooted in like in a spiritual principle that um, we do have, while we can't control 
what's happening outside of us, right? There's structural inequity, there's material needs, and there are people who are suffering. A lot of people who are from our communities, but are also belong to our, our human family. And that issues of, of race, of class, of gender, issues of, of poverty, war, and racism are not just issues for those people or for those communities that are affected, but that everyone is implicated in it. Because if we believe in a better world and a brighter future um, for our, our young ones to come after us, then we know that the principles of peace, practice, play, passion, persistence, perseverance, these principles um, are vital for our sustenance as, as a human species. And so Capoetics really moves with that pedagogy. Um, it's rooted in Pedagogy of the Heart, which is um, a book that the Brazilian activist Paulo Freire um, wrote. He also wrote Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is a seminal work for educators that just about any educator you come across, I'm sure we'll, be, we'll talk about Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And it's inspired by um, Bell Hooks teaching to transgress education as the practice of freedom. So that's sort of the basis for Capoetics. Um, it's exploring the power of movement and word through Capoeira and poetry. That's amazing. And I think that that kind of leads into my next question is that I feel like now more than ever, you can see how important people have found creativity and art in expressing um, dissent and nonviolent resistance. You see um, these pictures um, of George Floyd, you know, with all these beautiful colors and the pride movement is all about having the, the rainbow, you know, it's having all of these beautiful colors. Um, yeah. So can you talk about why you think that art is so important um, in bringing out these movements? And yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's so well said how you said, you know, um, Art is so essential to nonviolent resistance. When I think about, for example, the inception of, we'll take hip hop, for example. Um, in 1973, Cindy Campbell um, decided to invite her brother, uh, DJ Cool Herc, to come and DJ for a house party to celebrate the summer. And, um, and that would become the party that birthed this cultural phenomenon called hip hop. And the principles of hip hop emerged um, on the backdrop of um, economic exploitation, of um, a disenfranchised community, of young people seeking an outlet, seeking um, a place of value to spend their time, to not only spend their time, but to be nurtured, nourished, to be seen as human beings who were equally as valuable and worthy of dignity to achieve self-determination. So the principles were peace, love, unity, and having fun. And KRS-One will talk about um, the purpose of hip hop. He'll talk about how I am hip hop. Um, and he says that hip hop reports on the violences. And of course, its evolution has taken many various different kind of um, uh, pathways, right? As with many different cultural exports, uh, specifically coming from the black community. But I think that in its, in its inception and in its essence, that particular art form originally allowed for folks to reflect, to talk honestly about what they were seeing and the traumas they were experiencing in their communities as a result of um, a, a deprivation of basic material resources, right? Like it's believing art is saying the worst in the worst and the best are worthy of living inside of me that my human experience is as valuable as anyone else's that I get to be this complex complicated human that gets to discover and learn things about myself and in inshallah share those things such that other human beings walking this this planet for this limited amount of time Maybe this might uplift them too. Maybe this might offer up something that may help them see their world a little differently. 
because what is the world except for, you know, what is it, six billion different versions of it? That's what this one um, TED speaker who I love, he, he talks about lollipop moments and he says this so clearly. He talks about lollipop moments in leadership and that everyone is a leader. Every single human, we have, you know, we think of leadership as like the person that's on stage in front of the crowd with the microphone in their hand, right? But he talks about how, you know, leadership is taking place in every sphere that we occupy and that we all hold that capacity. And so anyway, he, um, I'm forgetting his name, but if you Google TED Talk leadership and lollipop moments, he'll come up and he has a beautiful way of um, characterizing the world as like 6 billion different renditions of it. And so, um, I do feel like art is at the center historically. Um, I gave one example of through hip hop um, and I have to shout out Follow the Keepers, which is a global collective of hip hop artists and scholars and activists that are documenting and centering and mining women's contributions to hip hop. Um, but I do think that it, it, what makes it so powerful is that it's subversive and that it can travel. Art is nonviolent in, in praxis. And so sometimes it meets the people who, it, it meets and it can disarm those who might otherwise be, um, be armed or on guard about receiving a message from someone who um, they might politically disagree with, but they hear them, they feel their art and somehow it touches the core of their humanity too, right? Or whether it's Aretha Franklin or Bill Withers. Um, I've been in conversations with a colleague at the Tough, the Multi-Faith Tough, Tough Chaplaincy who's been sharing with me the glory and the beauty of Leonard Cohen. And, um, and it's just, you know, it's art, it travels, right? Like I can appreciate the poetry of, um, of Amikai um, and I can appreciate the poetry of Mahmoud Darwish, or Amanda Gorman, or Maya, or Tony, or Zora Neale Hurston, or Jarena Lee, right? Like we could go on and on. And, um, and so I think art, it really reminds us, Dr. Cornell West would say art, you know, artists are the vanguard of humanity. They safeguard the best in our traditions such that we might shift, orient, be lifted, feel, feel hope. Yeah, and I think that's it's important when you think about the difference like music and poetry and like physical painting. It's it's nice to know that everybody has their own way that they can be creative. Maybe if you're not a talented drawer, you can use spoken word. Um, and it, maybe if you're not like a great singer, you can dance. Um, and that's that right. it can be for everyone, no matter who you are and, and what movement, even though all these movements are, it, you should see the intersectionality, it's that you can express yourself in these nonviolent ways, no matter who you are. That's um, right, that's right, precisely. I love how you 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 really honed in on that point of like, the, there's no wrong way to do it. <laughs> you don't have to be Picasso, you know, or I don't know, you don't have to sing like Mariah to open your vocal cords and to let out a sound and a tone that might actually really heal and help uplift um, that's what the spirituals in the in the black tradition come from there's this pbs documentary called the black church that henry Louis gates recently did and it kind of outlines the history of the black church within the u.s and it's so powerful and he he centers in on like what were the difference between the gospels the spirituals the hymns they're all kind of doing something here, but how do you differentiate them? And it was interesting to me to think like, there are just so many different ways and styles to engage the spirit, matters of the spirit. And that's what I think for me, art touches on. I kind of started drawing this pandemic. And so that's what you see behind me are some drawings. <laughs> um, I love it. Yeah, yeah. So I think your, your point around, yeah, you can embody it. You can let it like sometimes something might be sitting you know somewhere in your back or your neck or you feel something in your hand and it's like you get to let that flow through you such that you might arrive at a space where you feel like whoo all right like i can breathe now i feel my breath coming back to me i feel recentered um 
or you can sing it out or sound it out. Um, I think that's what I love about theater. And, and I, that's something I'm coming constantly back to with Copoetics is like the value of the theatrics. There's this principle of serial testimony in theater that we learn. And it's this idea that all the data you need is inside of the room, meaning all of the, when you're doing a sort of a theatrical analysis or a character analysis, a deep character analysis, you're diving into the who, what, where, why, when, and how of this character. Who, do, who are they speaking to? What are they speaking about? Why are they speaking? What do they desire? There's always a need that's needing to be met. And so when thinking, if I were to think about, wow, each of us as humans, we're all characters and we all have these things at play. Whether or not we're tapped into what it is we need is a different question. Some of us are more skilled at actually being able to communicate what it is that we need, but we're constantly open to, when we open ourselves up, to be transformed, to meet the conflict and the tension and see that tension as a, a site for, for generative understanding, like tension as transformation, naming unmet needs so that we can strengthen our skill sets. That's this TNS framework that I'm using more lately um, that I've, I've been imagining around and speaking on and, and thinking through. It really, um, it becomes, it becomes more easy to, to, to operate from a place of curiosity as opposed to cynicism. No, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. And I think that also kind of goes back to what you're saying with the, the hip hop, that one of the elements is that it's to have fun and, you know, singing in the streets can be an element, you know, to take something so grave and so grim, um, all of the discrimination, the oppression and have a voice, you know, and have a collective voice and in, in song. Um, and I think that that for me is something so powerful when I see it or I'm a part of it, um, to be a part of one of many voices, because you're saying it's all of these six, six billion different worlds, you know? That's right, yeah. Six billion under, different understandings of the world that we're, we're moving in. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's like, can you imagine, like, what would a, a march sound like or look like from afar or be like, whether you're participating in person without, like, those chants? Like, it might be, it might be a little dull. And I wonder if people would have, like, would people have been able to march for as long as they did for like over 50 miles in Selma, Alabama um, for the civil rights movement if there weren't those those chants and the songs. Yeah, it gives it like a little bit of life. I That's right. That. Um, can you maybe share a bit of a, a poem with us? <laughs> sure, yes, um, happy to, let's see. Um, it's always a gift. Um, hmm, all right. Take a look around you. What do you see? Everything they said you wouldn't, couldn't, and shouldn't be. We break boxes to be free. While cynics scoff and deceive, they said you wouldn't achieve. But you wouldn't believe all the pain they put you through. Throw in shame on your name, but can't change what God already ordained in you. So darling, keep your head up. Never let them see you sweat, because darkness can't drive out darkness. Hate can't drive out hate. And in this space, he can spark his love that can liberate. Grace to permeate. Shout out to MLK, yes. Because if you stay ready, ain't got to get ready so that we breeze through this life, moving slow and steady yet, firm and focused, yup, yup, you know this, we seize every moment, said you stay ready, ain't got to get ready so that we breeze through this life, moving slow and steady yet, firm and focused, yup, yup, you know this, we seize every moment, serving to scratch the surface, breaking boxes on purpose, no weapon can mark this, yeah, abundance in surplus, so darling, keep your head up. Never let them see you sweat because darkness can't drive out darkness and hate can't drive out hate. And in this space, we can spark the love to permeate, grace to recreate. Shout out to MLK and Malcolm. <laughs> Ooh, that's a that quick. I love that. I love that. I love that so much. And is that's like a part of the way you're saying the break the boxes. And I love the way you use like the B and music. And it was so I love that. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, it's it's just a quick a quick fix, turn around, and we're in the mix. Here we are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, it's it's um the rhythm, the rhythm um and the flow are gifts, you know, in Af I'm currently the Africana spirituality advisor at Tufts Multi-Face Chaplaincy. And one thing that I talk a lot about and that we talk a lot about are the, the principles, the characteristics that characterize what it means to feed life of the spirit. That's something I'm constantly thinking about. And in African cosmology, you know, we believe that the ancestors or those who have come before have provided gifts and resources that we can use and we can call on um, to, to get through hard times and also to celebrate the joys in life. And so any invitation to tap into and to utilize, we believe that ah, our job is to actually, to actualize, to utilize, to activate the gifts that we've been given such that they might be those, like the turning on of the light that can then spread more light in the darkness. And so um, this is the first time I'm actually characterizing it in that way, but your conversation is bringing that up for me. Well, thank you so much. And honestly, like that was an amazing, I'm so excited to go see all of the rest of the break the boxes stuff now, because oh. I loved, I love that. And I want to, I want to see the, the freedom one you said that. Is oh, yes. I, I, yeah, it's right there on, um, it's right there on our channel. It's, um, if you type in my name as Mira and then freedom on YouTube, it, it should come up. We made it about five, six years ago. And, um, I'll definitely yeah. put it all down in the links below and I'm I'm so excited to watch it and so excited to see other people watch it. Sweet. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's a, a great note to wrap up on. Um, I wanted to say thank you so much for coming to talk to me. It's been so nice getting to meet you. Um, and you're such an inspiration and so talented. Um, so thank you so much for using your voice in nonviolence and um, and your art. Um, it's so nice to meet you. And I hope we can talk soon. Yeah, thank you so much. This has been a pleasure. All right. <laughs> Bye. Thank you guys for watching and come back for another episode on Nonviolent International's uh, Spotlight series on nonviolence.